Hello and welcome to today's seminar in the Smart Mobility Connection series. My name is Haja Shahab and I am the Traffic 21 Women in Transportation Fellow. The Smart Mobility Connection series is sponsored by the Traffic 21 Institute and the Mobility 21 University Transportation Center as an opportunity for faculty to showcase their current transportation projects. It is also an opportunity for students fellow faculty, deployment partners, and the broader community to engage and network with researchers, highlight opportunities for involvement, and foster future interdisciplinary collaboration. Please note this session is being recorded and all participants' microphones are muted. To ask a question, please send a message through the chat box. You do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to send your questions. Now I would like you like to introduce today's speaker. Jeremy Mahalik is a professor of engineering and public policy and professor of mechanical engineering. He directs the vehicle electrification group which studies technology, life cycle economics and environmental implications, consumer behavior and public policy for electric vehicle technologies and other advanced vehicle technologies including alternative fuels, ride sharing, ride sourcing, and vehicle automation. Please help me welcome Professor Jeremy as he tells us about his University Transportation Center project, Uber Lyft implications, vehicle ownership, transit, electrification, air emissions, traffic externalities, and equity. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Uber and Lyft, and I'm going to give um, an overview of a few um, projects that include the University Transportation Project, which is really just beginning. Uh, and so I'm going to give some context of recent findings that we've had, how that's led us into this direction, and sort of what questions that we're addressing um, now. And if there are questions in the chat box, I'll try to monitor them as well. I don't mind getting interrupted during the talk. I think it would be nice to have a discussion. So, um, be happy to do that. So uh, yeah, I direct the vehicle electrification group. That effort started in 2009 and uh, had been focused on uh, electrification questions for about a decade. Um, but in the last five years or so, that sort of has transitions. I'm still studying electric vehicles, but I've uh, become uh, interested in uh, having that as part of a broader po portfolio of the big things that are happening in, uh, in transportation. So uh, UC Davis has this uh, framing that over the past century, there's a lot of ways that in which um, the way we move people and, and goods has been pretty static. Um, and yet right now we're at the beginning of some major changes in the way we, we do those things. So we're changing the fuel away from gasoline and diesel toward electricity. Uh, we're changing the driver away from people toward uh, automated vehicles. And we're even changing the ownership model um, away from personal vehicle ownership toward some other modes, including uh, shared mobility um, options, Uber and Lyft. And so today I'll focus on the Uber and Lyft type questions. So, um, so why this topic? I mean, uh, many reasons. One reason is that uh, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. In the United States right now, and this comes primarily from passenger cars and light trucks, and Uber and Lyft are making big changes to what's happening in passenger cars and light trucks, and particularly in cities. And so these uh, ride sourcing services, um, so let me uh, clarify the technology because uh, even in the transportation community, uh, these terms are not um, yet consistently used. So ride sharing is sometimes used to mean all kinds of things, uh, SAE is trying to define um, ride sharing to be more specifically like car pooling and van pooling, that sort of thing. Whereas ride hailing would be something where you can hail a vehicle that you can hail on the street. So that would be like a regular taxi, not like an Uber and Lyft, which you're not supposed to be able to hail from the street. You hail that through a, um, an app where you make a request. So we call those ride sourcing where you make the request through an app. And so that'll use the term ride sourcing. And then TNCs or transportation network companies, those are the companies that provide ride sourcing services. So that's how I'll use those two terms in this talk. So um, 
yeah, the share of passenger, this is pre-COVID, the share of uh, passenger trips for in for hire vehicles doubled and over the last uh, decade. And so that means that it's not Uber and Lyft just displacing taxis. They're definitely inducing a bunch of new demand and maybe pulling from other, um, from other modes. And uh, already five years ago, 15% uh, of all intra-urban trips in San Francisco were served by Uber and Lyft. So uh, a pretty major change to uh, urban travel. And so we've been interested in some of the uh, implications of this change. And the main questions I'll focus on today are, uh, what effects Uber and Lyft have already had on cities? Uh, what are the externality implications of this sh shift toward ride sourcing? And I'll define externalities uh, along the way. And then how different would an optimal ride sourcing fleet, um, uh, how different would it, would it uh, operate if it faced the costs of its uh, externalities? So those are my three, uh, th three questions I'll focus on. Let's start with the first one. What effects have Uber and Lyft ha already had on U.S. cities? So, under your, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're going to see it in this um, uh, this um, call, but do you have an option in the panel to vote yes, no under the uh, under um, responses? I'm not seeing it on my side, and I usually I can do. create a poll, Jeremy. Okay, that sounds good. So my question is, I'm gonna ask about what effects Uber and Lyft have already had on US cities. And I'm gonna focus on two outcomes. Uh, first is vehicle ownership. And I guess what I wanna know is, uh, do you think when Uber and Lyft show up in a city that people will own more vehicles after Uber and Lyft are present or fewer vehicles? So the options are more or fewer for the poll. If you have reactions underneath, uh, you can also just give me a green check to me. Oh, there we go, it's there. So yeah, what do you think? More or fewer? Interesting, fairly diverse. So we got about two thirds saying fewer and one third saying uh, more. Okay, so we'll go over this more in a second. And what about, uh, here's a second uh, poll. What about the same, same question, but uh, instead of ownership, what about the effect on transit? Do you think that when Uber and Lyft show up in a city that people will use transit more or people will use transit less? Okay, very good. Looks like the less is winning out, but by a lower, smaller margin. So, well, it's getting close to two thirds less and more, one third more. Okay, so let's talk about these. Um, thanks for your input. So, um, so let's think about what's happening when TNCs uh, serve a ride as compared to when you take your personal vehicle. So if I take my personal vehicle from my origin O to my destination D, that's the entire travel of that vehicle, maybe some additional travel to search for parking. Whereas if I call an Uber, uh, the Uber is gonna travel from wherever it was when I made the call up to get me. And so there's some additional travel there. Plus that Uber may have been cruising around waiting for my call. And so this additional travel from A to B to O is, um, is called deadheading. It's the travel that the vehicle has to make uh, in order to, uh, additional travel that the vehicle has to make without a person in the vehicle in order to serve those vehicle trips. And so there's reasons to believe that there could be positive and negative effects on the kinds of impacts that we just talked about. And this deadheading is one important component. Uh, deadheading means that vehicle uh, miles traveled and emissions could go up as a result of shifting toward Uber and Lyft because 
the vehicle has to travel more in order to service the same routes. Also because it's an additional mode of travel. So it means that if there were trips that were difficult or expensive or inconvenient to make with other modes, adding a new mode, at least in some cases, is gonna give people uh, a more desirable option to travel and they may travel more than they would have otherwise. So all those things could increase. Uh, travel. But there's some effects on the other side as well. Um, Uber and Lyft provide a higher marginal cost of travel that's observable to the, to the traveler. And so once I've purchased my vehicle, the cost of driving it a few more miles is very small. Whereas if I call an Uber, I'm going to have to pay that the cost of taking that trip versus not taking that trip is larger. And so it gives me a little bit more of an incentive to find alternative modes for specific trips when they're appropriate. It's also true that TNC vehicles uh, tend to uh, be hot longer because they uh, start up, get hot, and then they serve a bunch of rides before they cool down again. And that's going to make them more efficient and lower emitting, and we'll talk about that in some detail as well. On car ownership, um, Uber and Lyft, uh, some, so drivers of Uber and Lyft purchase vehicles just to drive for Uber and Lyft. Uh, plus they provide an income stream and it's a flexible income stream. So you can certainly imagine some households that are on the verge of, or the boundary of being able to afford a new vehicle, having this option to work on the weekends and make the payments or something like that could lead them to increase ownership. But of course, uh, Uber and Lyft are, in, are also a, a, compete, a competitor for um, car ownership. And so travelers, riders, uh, may need fewer vehicles in their household if they know they can rely on Uber and Lyft for some of their travel. And then uh, in terms of transit, um, I'm thinking the people who said transit use might increase are thinking that, well, Uber and Lyft can get you, can solve the first um, last mile problem. They can get you to a transit line, particularly if it's a commuter line. It may be traveling the long distance. And it's a matter of getting from your house up to that line in order to be able to use it. So you could see some increase in use. But of course, DNCs also compete with transit. They allow point-to-point -point access instead, uh, instead of having to uh, walk to, wait for transit, and then uh, travel with uh, many other people. So there's reasons to believe that these effects could be increasing or decreasing. And the question that we were asking was, um, what's the net effect? Can we observe what the net effect is? And the way we're going to be able to get at that is uh, to take advantage of the fact that Uber and Lyft have entered different cities at different times. So by 2017, uh, they're already in half of, of uh, cities, urban areas, metro areas in the US. Usually Uber is entering first. So this 45 degree line on the, on the chart is when Uber and Lyft enter at the same time. Above that line are the cities that en Uber entered before Lyft. Um, and, but not always, so Lyft enter, enters a couple cities first. The bottom line is that because they enter different cities at different times, we can leverage that to try to isolate the changes in cities that were caused by Uber and Lyft and separate it from other kinds of changes that were happening in cities over time or other kinds of differences among cities. So we're going to do that using a difference in difference approach. And the idea with the difference in difference approach is I'm going to take as a dependent variable the, uh, the things that I'm interested in. So transit usage, use or uh, vehicle ownership, for example. And transit use and vehicle ownership are affected by the presence of Uber and Lyft, which I'll call X, my treatment, whether or not Uber and Lyft are present in the city at that time. But of course, transit ridership and vehicle ownership might be affected by other things as well. And so we add a whole bunch of controls uh, to try to uh, control for other things that might be affecting those outcomes. And then there's fixed effects for the city and for the time. And that, those fixed effects for the city are going to account for the fact that Pittsburgh is different than New York City. And so we would expect different types of ownership and transit patterns. Um, and the time is going to account for the fact that if there's a recession or something else going on, it may affect travel across all cities. And so uh, that helps us uh, uh, capture other kinds of things that we might not be able to observe in our control. So all of these things together are controlling for a bunch of other stuff that could affect these outcomes. And what we're left with is to try to, fit, uh, to, try to see of the remaining variation, which would be differences in the, trend, in the time trends of vehicle ownership or um, transit use across cities, what of those remaining changes can be explained by the presence of Uber and Lyft. That's the approach. And we're gonna take one more step, which is we wanna avoid conflation. 
And so to try to control for conflation, like maybe Uber and Lyft are entering certain types of cities first or not entering certain types of cities because of their characteristics. And we don't wanna conflate those two uh, things. So what we do is uh, inverse probability of treatment weighting, which basically takes cities that weren't treated but are similar to cities that were treated in the things we can observe about those cities and weights them more highly. So that way, when we're comparing treated and untreated cities, cities with, where Uber exists and doesn't exist, we're, um, we're comparing cities that are otherwise similar. So uh, with all of that, what do we find? So we find that uh, when Uber and Lyft enter US cities on average, uh, the vehicle ownership actually increases in those cities um, about a little less than a percent. Um, that doesn't mean that it increases in all cities. It's actually different in different types of cities. But that average is like if I were to choose a randomly selected city and just add Uber to it, on average, what would I expect to have in, in that city? And on average, I would expect that the vehicle ownership to actually increase um, about 0.7 percent. Um, the, we see differences across cities. It looks like those increases mostly happen in larger car dependent and slow, de slow growth cities. So what I mean by car dependent is cities that already have high vehicle ownership per capita. So those are cities like Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, St. Louis. Um, and so the statistics don't tell us why that's true, but, um, but our interpretation is that if you're in a car dependent city, uh, you rely on vehicle trans transport to get to most of the places that uh, you want to visit. And so Uber and Lyft can provide some additional travel options for particular um, applications or for particular travel instances. Like, for example, I want to go out to the bar with my friends and get home safely without a designated driver. Let's just do an Uber for this trip. You know, those kinds of things could be um, helping, but there's less of an ability to just shed vehicles altogether and use Uber and Lyft for everything if you're in a more car dependent city. So that means that the increase in ownership from drivers appears to outweigh the ability of riders to shed their um, other vehicles. And with transit, we see that there's a larger displacement of transit uh, ridership in cities that have higher income and fewer children, cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. And this makes some intuitive sense because you might expect than in cities where more of the travelers have extra disposable income um, or and don't have car seats to manage and those kinds of things, that those are the kinds of travelers who uh, you know, might opt to not wait for the bus and instead pay for a convenient point-to-point -point, uh, fast service. Um, so that difference in the effects of Uber and Lyft across cities is one of the big um, uh, findings from our, from our work. And we're hoping that that helps in the future to, uh, for future studies, for people to be thinking about heterogeneity across these cities, and that it's not just one type of effect that Uber has, it really depends on the kind of city that's being affected. Uh, we did subject these kind of this study to a whole bunch of robustness checks, and so we feel confident that this is what's going on. And so there's still questions about what implications there might be for these kinds of changes. So vehicle ownership goes up, that's certainly not what we expect, that's certainly not what Uber, or what many of us expect, that's not what Uber and Lyft advertise. Um, but if that is happening, is that a bad thing? That's a little harder to say. Usually vehicle, higher vehicle ownership is associated with more vehicle travel, which means emissions, congestion, crashes, all of the things that come along with vehicle travel. Um, but that may not necessarily be the case here um, because this is a specific type of vehicle ownership increase and, and associated with Uber and Lyft, we don't know yet. What we'd really like to know is how it affects travel, and uh, we just don't know that yet. So I think this study raises some important questions about the effect that Uber and Lyft are having, but we still don't quite know what the effect of, on travel is. Travel is, And then um, in terms of transit, I think there's a more direct uh, implication that if there's more displacement of transit in these kinds of cities, it's pretty clear if you're displacing transit and moving toward TNCs instead, you're gonna see increases in these kinds of externalities like pollution and, um, and um, uh, congestion and those kinds of things. So that's kind of a segue into the second question I'm gonna ask is um, as we transition toward uh, ride sharing or ride um, sourcing applications, 
what are the implications of that for, um, for these externalities? So the, I got a couple of direct questions. So one is, um, how does whether or not a city has ride pooling affect the impact? Okay, and so we did not uh, separate ride pooling. It's a little challenging. Ride pooling is when um, a ride, ride sourcing service allows two people to um, you know, be in the vehicle at the same time with different origin destinations. Um, so I will talk a little bit about pooling in the next uh, set of questions in terms of its impact on externalities. But in this study that I just presented, we can't tell um, which cities have pooling and which ones don't. It's a little bit complicated because the boundaries on where you can request a pooled ride and where you can't vary by city and they also vary over time. It's difficult to get those data. Uh, so we're just looking at sort of the average effect there. Good question. Another one was uh, how do we control uh, inputs so that we know the increase in ownership is correlated, whether it's correlated or, uh, or resulting from Uber or other factors. And that's back to the difference in difference approach. So if the assumptions behind difference in difference hold, then we do establish causal effects from Uber and Lyft and isolate them from all other changes that are happening. So if vehicle ownership goes up because GDP goes up, we have that in our controls and also we have that in our direct controls. And we also have that because if it affects vehicle ownership in all cities, that'll be picked up by the, um, by the fixed effects. So the only thing that's left is if we see an increase in one city, but the other city doesn't increase. And if that happens at the same time that Uber enters that city that where things increased, that's where we was attributed to it. So it's basically we're controlling for a lot of things. And the only thing we're left with is where there are differences in the trends over time between cities that co-occur with the entrance of Uber and Lyft. And that's what we're attributing to Uber and Lyft. That's how we isolate. Um, okay, great. So let's segue into that second study. So if there are these trends, like away from transit and toward uh, Uber and Lyft in certain kinds of cities, what are the implications of those trends? And we're gonna think of those in terms of the externalities. What I mean by externality is it's a cost or benefit that's imposed on a third party who didn't agree to incur that cost or benefit. So if you think about the big benefit of using markets and having free trade is that uh, if two parties agree to a transaction, they usually only agree if the transaction benefits both of the parties. And so you get this net increase in wealth because both parties agree to each trade or benefit from each trade they agree to. That doesn't necessarily hold if there's a third party who gets affected by that act economic activity or that transaction uh, who wasn't part of the decision making. And so that's called a market failure. And um, generally when you have those kinds of market failures, those are reasons why um, markets fail to generate efficient outcomes. They, they fail to um, find, so generate solutions where there's more wealth being generated for society. They end up causing too much cost somewhere because the cost isn't being considered in the prices. And so that's one of the key justifications for policy intervention. And so we wanna think about uh, what kind of uh, externality implications uh, there are for uh, Uber and Lyft. Let me pause to read a question here. Yeah, okay, so there's a question about uh, uh, congestion and what's, what's sort of actually having more impact on cities. So actually, I think I'm gonna get Robin to your question um, uh, in, this, in this section. So please ask again if you don't feel like I cover it. But let me talk about what these uh, examples of these externalities are associated with uh, automobile uh, use. So first is congestion. Uh, in most estimates, the largest externality. Um, the idea is, so if the roads are close to capacity and I travel on, on the vehicle, I, I travel my vehicle on that road, uh, it may take me longer to get to my destination. The fact that it takes me longer, it's not an externality. That's a cost to me. I can consider that cost when I make decisions about where to travel and, how, and when. And so uh, that's not a problem. That's internalized because I already know, I already can uh, include that cost in my decision making. The external part is the fact that adding my extra vehicle to the road is gonna slightly slow down traffic for everyone else who's on the road. So if all of you are on the road with me, you're getting impacted by my decision to be on that road. That's the externality. It's the extra minutes of time that it would take all of the rest of you to get to your destinations because of my additional vehicle on the road. Uh, so all vehicle travel has impact on other vehicles. And so that's where those congestion uh, costs come from. The second is crashes. Again, when I travel, uh, I 
increase some risk that I may be involved in a, in a collision and there could be a tra traffic fatality. Um, but I can internalize that presumably, or at least my insurance can and charge me for that. For that. The part that's uh, external is that uh, when I'm on the road, I slightly increase the risk that all of you will get into an accident and there'll be a fatality. And so um, it's the impact that my action has on you of increasing your uh, risk that is that externality from crashes. And then there are from emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants are similar. I get the benefit of driving my vehicle, the cost of the uh, lessened air quality in terms of uh, increased health uh, problems from respiratory or cardiovascular issues um, gets distributed to all of you. So, you know, I get, I get the benefit of driving. The cost is a very small increase in risk to everybody in the, in the region. And so um, that small increase in risk, that's the externality associated with air pollution and, and greenhouse gas emissions. So those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. So let's think about how those uh, types of externalities apply to, um, to Uber and Lyft. So if I were, uh, let's compare to the case where there's two travelers who want to go from their origins, one and two in blue, to their destinations in red. If they drive their personal vehicles, then there'll be two separate vehicles, each driving from its origin to its destination. And then, and then we're done. Whereas if these two travelers call a lift um, that ends up picking up both of them, it might look something more like this. The lift navigates to pick up the first passenger, takes them to their location, navigates to pick up the second passenger, takes them to their location, and then continues on. So the dotted lines, again, are that deadheading. It's the additional vehicle miles traveled that the lift has to take in order to serve the same rides. And so that's definitely going to increase some of those externalities because if there's extra vehicle miles traveled, extra chances for car accidents, congestion, emissions during that travel, etc. However, on the other side, when I drove those two separate personal vehicles to, to, for the two travelers, uh, they both had to start up cold. And when I say cold, I don't mean winter. I mean, uh, I mean cold like ambient temperature. I mean less than several hundred degrees because you need to heat up the catalyst in the exhaust stream to a few hundred degrees before it starts transforming the pollutants uh, from the uh, engine exhaust uh, into harmless uh, outputs out of the tailpipe. So basically every time you start your vehicle after it's been sitting for a while, there's a large plume of emissions that um, uh, before the catalyst starts operating and uh, converting those pollutants. And then once you're operating hot, the emissions are much, much, much lower. Um, so for one example, Alan Robinson at Carnegie Mellon and others have had uh, have studied these difference between this cold start and have found that for cer certain pollutant species, uh, a single cold start generates as much pollution as uh, 200 miles of hot travel. So the fact that that Uber was hot when it showed up to pick up both of those passengers matters. You start the Uber one time and then you end up picking up a whole bunch of passengers. And so that uh, impact of that cold start gets distributed over many uh, passengers. And so that's a benefit of switching toward ride sourcing. So let's see how these things stack up when we put them together. We'll start with the emissions implications. Um, so um, what we're seeing here is uh, on the left is what the external costs from emissions, from air emissions would be if you took a personal vehicle on average, and on the right, what they would be if you uh, called an Uber instead. So what we see on the left at the top two is cold start air pollution during the cold start, and also additional greenhouse gas emissions from the cold start. It, the green, there's no catalyst to convert greenhouse gas emissions, but when you start a vehicle cold, it's also a bit less efficient. The, the um, lubricants are more viscous. Uh, the parts of the piston and the cylinder haven't expanded yet due to the heat, so they're not in their final kind of geometry. There's a bunch of reasons why the, the vehicle operates less efficiently when it's cold. And so there's some additional emissions from that. And those pretty much go away if you almost go away when you call an Uber instead, because that single cold start gets divided over many trips. Once the vehicle's hot, the air pollution associated with that actually improves when you call an Uber as well. That's despite the fact 
that the Uber traveled more miles. And it's just because on average, the vehicles driving for Uber and Lyft tend to be newer and therefore subject to stricter emissions regulation than the vehicles that they displace. And so on average, if you switch to an Uber, even though it drives longer, you still get an improvement in air, uh, in, um, air emission reduction or air pollution reductions. So in terms of air pollutants, um, Uber's actually cleaning the air. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, that's um, not the case though, because even though uh, there is a reduction in the um, cold, in, in the emissions associated with the vehicle when it's inefficient, when it's cold, still the fact that the vehicle drives a lot more in order to, that deadheading in order to service all the rides means that there's gonna be more greenhouse gas emissions overall. So if you put all those things together, overall on air emissions, you get a little bit of a decrease by shifting from a private vehicle to a, um, an Uber. So let me uh, get up to speed on the questions again. Okay, great. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm following all of the questions, but let me, let me try. So let's see, Daniel's just asking, what is, the, what is the average ride that occurs while the TNC is hot? Daniel, I'm not sure I'm catching your question, sorry. Um, number of rides, oh, okay. Yes, uh, the number of rides, okay, so the, how many rides does, a, does a, an Uber driver serve per time they start the car? Yeah, so we do a Monte Carlo around this, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. And I'm forgetting the number now, I have to go back. I think it's something around like seven rides, something like that, but I, I, I have to check you know, that number, something on that order. And then, um, there's a question about, uh, or a note about uh, people making decisions on marginal cost and people who own cars might drive more than people who drive TNCs, that's right. So this analysis that I'm showing you right now is just looking if you had one trip and you were deciding whether to take it in a personal vehicle or take it in a TNC vehicle. This is what the comparison would be. It may be that with the TNCs, you'd end up taking more trips because it, it gives you more opportunities, or maybe you'd take fewer trips because uh, you observe that higher marginal cost. Uh, we don't know about that yet. So this is just comparing for a given trip. Okay, great. So uh, looks like Uber's cleaning the air. Um, however, I left out those other traffic externalities in the last graph. So let's add them in now. Those re the reduced emissions that you have in sort of the yellow, orange, blue, gray at the bottom are outweighed by the impact on traffic externalities. So even though the emissions are reducing, the impact on congestion and crashes of the extra vehicle miles traveled outweighs that. And so you end up with a net increase in externalities, which means that those unpriced costs to society are going up overall on average when you shift to an Uber instead of a personal vehicle. There are some things that could change this if the Uber was better than ordinary drivers at avoiding congested routes, or if the Uber was better than ordinary drivers at avoiding crashes, then we might see a reduction in some of the things on the right-hand side here. We don't know that. Um, here. So we're just using the same average estimates of congestion and crashes per mile to do this comparison. So if I put all, so this difference between a private vehicle and Uber vehicle is about 50 cents. So now I'm going to start showing you distributions of the difference. How much, if I do that shift to a TNC, how much am I changing the externalities? Here's what the distribution of those differences look like. This first um, one here is that same 50 cents increase. If I shift from a personal vehicle to a TNC vehicle on average, I'm going to increase externalities by about 50 cents. That looks a lot worse if, I, if what I'm shifting away from is a transit. So if I would have taken a bus or a train and I take an Uber instead, now I'm increasing my externalities by maybe like more like $1.50 per trip. Um, and that's because the marginal uh, impact on emissions and congestion of getting on a bus, the bus was going to do that route anyway. So one more person getting on the bus doesn't really change the uh, externalities very much. Uh, and so, whereas if you're an extra vehicle on the road, you do. So there's a, so this says we really don't want to be encouraging people from getting off of transit and onto um, uh, TNCs. 
Now, you could electrify the TNC vehicles. If all the TNC vehicles were electric and the personal vehicles were not, you'd see a slight in improvement in the benefits of uh, shifting to a TNC, but it's still only slight. It really doesn't solve the overall problem. Um, what could make more of an impact is pooling, uh, which was mentioned in the question earlier. If I'm getting off of a, uh, instead of driving my personal vehicle, I get into an Uber and it's a pooled Uber, then that vehicle uh, is actually reduced, it could potentially reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled because even though it had to deadhead to get to me, it displaced two personal vehicle trips instead of one. And so there could be a net reduction in mileage. I wanna be the caveat here is that it doesn't actually work for 100% pooling. In fact, the 100% here doesn't mean 100% of all trips pooled. It just means 100% uh, probability of a individual trip being pooled. Individual trips can be pooled because uh, it may be that I'm going from my house to Carnegie Mellon, someone else is going from a house down the block to Carnegie Mellon, and it, the Uber doesn't have to go very far out of its way to pick both of us up. And that's, what, that's the number you're seeing here. If we were actually to try to pool every single ride, well, then Ubers would have to be driving all over town to try to like, you know, make sure there were two people in the car at every time, it, it, you know, at every moment. And that would potentially increase vehicle miles traveled, which is not what we would want. So there's a subset of trips that can be pooled. And when they are pooled, that looks like uh, where we get the big benefit from um, uh, of uh, TNCs on externalities. Okay. So so the last uh, question I'll, I'll uh, address, well, let's see, let me check the question thing here, just a moment. Yeah, so Daniel's saying, well, the pooling here is actually conservative in a way because it's only addressing um, when two, pa two passengers get pooled. So that's true. I mean, there are cases where three passengers get pooled or even more in like a, in a uh, Uber uh, van or something like that. And, uh, and that would be even it look even better than this in terms of the displacement of personal vehicles. But on the other side, it's also assuming that those passengers are going from the same location to the same location. As soon as they're going from slightly different locations to slightly different locations, there may be some additional travel associated with going out of the way from one person's trip in order to pick up the other person. And that's a little bit of extra vehicle miles traveled that we're sort of not accounting for here. So I think it would take a more detailed analysis to, about pooling in order to get into that. And I will mention at the end of this talk uh, that we're doing some of that analysis right now. So, uh, oh, in fact, to motivate that, I should say, um, the whole thing here is saying that, uh, that these externalities are, matter that they're cost to society, but they're not priced. And so the TNC does not have an incentive to account for them when making decisions about its fleet. So one question we might ask is, would a TNC behave differently if it did have to face these costs? So if it had to face the cost of emissions, would it tend to electrify more? Even though electric electrification on its own doesn't solve the problem, it does make an improvement. And so it's valid to ask, suppose TNCs were to pay for the cost of their emissions, would that change their, um, their, fleet, behavior, their fleet investment or um, operations at all? And then uh, secondly about pooling, um, if uh, TNCs had to pay for the cost of congestion and crashes and emissions, would that encourage them to uh, realize a higher degree of pooling? So I'm gonna talk about the results from the first question about, uh, about emissions and how that might incentivize electrification now. And then the pooling question is the one that we're still working on. And I'm looking forward to showing results maybe the next time I present to this group. So let's ask that question about emissions and electrification. Uh, should Uber and Lyft electrify their fleets? Well, there's definitely some pros. Electric vehicles are generally cheaper to operate. Um, they have the potential to reduce emissions and they're a natural fit for urban driving. Uh, in stop and go driving, that's where hybrid and electric vehicles have an a lot of their benefit. I mean, that's where you can see economic and environmental benefits. Whereas uh, if you're just cruising on the highway, uh, you might see higher costs for almost no be environmental benefits. So there's a lot of benefit uh, to, it was a good fit for this type of environment. On the other side, there's higher fixed costs to purchasing an electric vehicle. Ride sourcing might be a really good application because there's so much driving being done by a lot of these vehicles that you have the potential to make up for the higher fixed costs. But not every ride sourcing vehicle drives intensively. Um, most of you, I'm sure, taken Uber and Lyft uh, drives. I don't know how much you talk to your drivers, but 
some drivers drive full time uh, and maybe purchase a vehicle just for that job. Some drivers drive once in a while when they just want a little bit of extra income. And that's a big difference in terms of whether the variable cost uh, savings of an electric vehicle could outweigh the higher purchase cost. Uh, electric vehicles also can't serve trips while they're recharging. And so if you have to go out of service periodically to recharge the vehicle and it's slow to recharge, that's a disadvantage. Um, and uh, navigating to and from those charging locations more frequently is gonna increase uh, these vehicle miles traveled. So we have a number of questions that we're interested in based on all of this. What kind of tech technology mix is really optimal for a ride hailing fleet? Should they be all electric? Maybe all gasoline is still better? maybe some mix of the two. And if we were to internalize these externalities, charge the fleet operator for the cost of the emissions caused by the fleet, how much would that change the, uh, these optimal decisions? And how does that vary across location? So what we do to answer this question is we build a optimization model that, uh, that uh, looks for the optimal fleet design, the technology mix, which would be how many gasoline, hybrid, and electric vehicles should I have in the fleet? And then how should I dispatch each of them in order to satisfy some exogenous demand? Um, so this is really a um, supply-focused model in the sense that um, our goal is to figure out what mix of conventional hybrid and, and battery electrics and what uh, ways to dispatch them it can satisfy uh, a requirement at, at minimum cost. And then we're gonna look to see how that answer changes under a tax that is supposed to internalize these external costs of emissions. On the supply side though, we're just treating the demand as fixed. So we look at uh, data from uh, ride sourcing fleets um, that a ride, uh, rides that were actually served by ride sourcing fleets. And then we just say, how can we serve those same rides at minimum cost? In practice, there's really a supply and demand issue is that you know, a TNC that doesn't want to serve a ride could just charge more for it and induce that rider to um, you know, find an alternative mode. Or conversely, uh, if they can reduce the cost of rides, they would induce new demand for those rides. And that's all out of scope in this analysis. So given all of that, uh, within that scope, what we see is that if we charge the TNC for the cost of their emissions, that induces an increase in uh, the adoption and use of electric vehicles, as well as a reduction of air pollution emissions. So for example, um, in New York City at the bottom here, if, there's, if it's just a free market and there's no tax on the emissions costs, uh, then the, Senate, the fleet still has an incentive to electrify about 14% of the miles. Um, not all of the miles, because some of the vehicles aren't used intensively enough to justify it. Uh, but if I charge the fleet for the cost of emissions, uh, that gives them an incentive to more than double the uh, use of electric vehicles in the fleet. And that comes with a reduction in the air emission externalities, uh, about 10% in New York City, about 22% in LA. In LA, I think this represents about $30 million a year worth of uh, costs to human health from the change in air pollution induced by these um, emissions. So. Um, Interestingly, the impact on overall social cost of internalizing these externalities is pretty low. It's just like a couple percent. So we're not changing total cost to society very much by doing this. What we're changing is who's paying that cost. So basically right now, uh, people who breathe air are paying a lot of the costs. Um, and if we were to internalize that, it would shift that cost toward the um, riders and drivers of, and owners of TNCs um, and away from the, the, breathe, the people who breathe. So we'd be at like a reduction in LA of $30 million worth of health costs to people who breathe in that area. That's the idea. And there's a question about... Yeah, and that's right. And Robin brings up a good point is that um, uh, I'm only looking here about what the impact would be of taxing externalities or um, internalizing those externalities for TNC fleets. But there's no reason we should only be concerned about externalities from TNC fleets. We're concerned about externalities from personal vehicles and from transit and everything. Um, so I, we're just looking here at what the impact is on, on these TNC fleets alone.
Okay, so again, that context is that this model is like there's a centralized decision maker whose goal is to minimize cost and has perfect information about where the rides are gonna be and how to get the vehicles there. Um, and it's also assuming that this sort of uh, tax on the externality to pricing these emissions are passed through to the TNC. So for example, if I tax emissions from uh, a um, power plant, um, really, if I tax the power sector, the power sector is going to change what they're doing. I mean, they're going to retire some coal plants and they're going to change the dispatch. Of, and so they're going to change the, the emissions associated with electricity. And that's not included here. It's too big of a scope. And so we're just sort of assuming whatever the costs are of emissions associated with charging those vehicles, that's being paid by the TNC. So this is a caveat. And there's also no consideration of dual use. A lot of Uber Lyft drivers drive for Uber part of the time, but they use the same vehicle to drive for their family. And so they may have additional use intensity associated with that that we're not considering here. But despite all of those caveats, I think that what we still see from the study that's really useful, two things. One, the optimal fleet isn't all one technology. In all of the cases we ran, the optimal fleet involves some mix of technologies. And so a really blunt policy instrument in fact, that, in fact, that's on my next, uh, uh, no, it's not, sorry. But um, so a really blunt policy instrument that says, uh, you know, all vehicles should be electric or something might not be best um, because uh, it's actually optimal to uh, maintain some, some gasoline vehicles uh, to handle some of those less intensive, you know, uh, duty cycles. Uh, the other thing is that the taxing the externality makes a big difference. So if we internalize the price of emissions, if somebody was paying those price of emissions instead of just people who breathe air, it changes decisions. And so that gives some indication that there's a role for uh, policy. So the other part of the context is Uber and Lyft have already pledged to shift to 100% electric vehicles by 2030. Maybe by 2030, uh, they will be optimal for the entire fleet because costs will come down so much. Um, our analysis only kind of shows where they are today, although we do some sensitivity about future prices as well. Um, and there are programs that allow riders to uh, request a hybrid or electric vehicle with a surcharge. And that provides some incentive um, for drivers to adopt these vehicles because they can earn that additional surcharge. I personally would not do this because if I'm calling uh, for an electric Uber, uh, it's not just that I have to wait more, but that vehicle might have to come from farther away and that's causing additional congestion and crashes and those kinds of things. Um, and so there's some trade-offs in this in trying to design this kind of a system. Um, yeah, and there's a question about like the $30 million, like where do these actual numbers come from for what the cost of these externalities are or the health costs in this case? So these come from epi epidemiological studies uh, that look at how changes in ambient concentrations of air pollutants in, in, um, uh, in a region are uh, correlated with changes in outcomes, uh, health outcomes in that region. And they do, of course, a whole bunch of work to try to figure out what's really caused by the air pollution control for other things and those sorts of things. So there are a number of studies like this and they, uh, you know, there's some uncertainty, but we actually, I only showed you one model. We actually run a number of different models to see, give, you know, to try to span some of that uncertainty. Uh, so even though we don't know uh, the exact number, 30 million point zero 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 or something like that, um, order of magnitude, I think these models tend to agree on, on, um, on the amount of uh, damages that are being caused. And they monetize health damages. It's a whole other discussion we could have. And if we want to focus on it at the end, I'd be happy to. But how do you monetize uh, the value of human life? So if, if you have some additional risks of, lo of life lost, what is, how do you put a dollar value on that? And the short answer is that we're not putting a dollar value on life's lost. We're putting a dollar value on the willingness to accept risk of, of lost life. We all accept risk, um, you know, all the time. And, and the question is how much, you know, at what point is the risk changing your decisions? Uh, and that's what economists look at. So I can talk in more detail about that if, if people want to. So I guess the last um, thing I want to mention is that uh, the active questions that we're doing, including the Mobility 21 uh, projects, are, um, let's start with number one, I, which I mentioned earlier, which is we're trying to expand those questions about, um, about, uh, uh, about the question of internalizing externalities to see how it impacts pooling. We said pooling is one of the key ways that the TNCs could provide net benefits. Uh, of these externalities. And so we wanna ask that question is if, if the 
um, if the TNC was charged for the cost of externalities, would they, would they figure out a way to pool more? And secondly, uh, we're doing some investigation of, of, pol of TNC policy. So Chicago has started taxing downtown rides. This was in early 2020 before COVID hit. They started taxing um, TNC rides that start or end downtown higher than other rides. And they also taxed solo rides higher than pool rides. And so suddenly there's a different, price, different pricing structure. And so we're looking at before and after that change in pricing structure. Can we see the difference of what happened? Did people actually travel less to downtown or did they pool more in the downtown region? And so we're trying to assess that econometrically. And then the third area, which is a new project we just started in January, uh, funded by Mobility 21, um, is asking questions about how TNCs uh, affect equity. Um, and so uh, one thrust of those questions is how Uber and Lyft have affected employment and wages in U.S. cities. So we've already asked the question, as Uber and Lyft show up in a city, vehicle ownership and transit use change. But it's also true that they're affecting jobs and they're affecting, um, you know, they're giving another employment opportunity. And they're also affecting the ability of people to get to a job interview or those kinds of things. So we want to see if we can find effects in, um, in employment, wages, um, and how, how well distributed they are. There are certain kinds of people that are getting hurt or helped by, by this change. Now, the second is we're doing a deep dive into regions like Chicago where there's a lot of detailed data on what TNCs are doing so we can understand who they're really serving and also how that might change. I mean, it's changed a lot since COVID and we can see it because we have it in the data. So we're looking to characterize that. We're also doing qualitative work on um, interviews of uh, drivers, riders, and other stakeholders to try to understand what their perceptions are about equity issues related to TNCs that can help inform our research questions. And then we have these simulators like the last one that I showed where we're sort of assigning vehicles to, uh, to pick up uh, riders. And we can use those uh, types of simulators to try to simulate what the impact would be of alternative policy approaches. So I had shown like taxing externalities as the, as the uh, one policy approach, but there's lots of other things you could do, require a certain amount of pooling or um, require that certain neighborhoods be served. Uh, you know, under, an underserved neighborhood needs to be served at least you know, X percent of the rides or something. So there's a variety of policy options. And what we wanna do is be able to understand what equity and uh, efficiency and, uh, and unintended consequences these policy options might have and see them ahead of time so we can help advise policy that would um, produce uh, more desired outcomes. So that is the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, so there's a question about, is there, is there going to be future uh, uh, further research into the future impact of congestion charging policy in the U.S. in places like New York City? Yes, we're actually in, I didn't mention that on the last slide and should have. Um, one of the things we're looking at in the question about pooling is if we're going to internalize externalities. So uh, when I drive, I cause congestion costs to all of you. But that really depends what road I drive on and what time. Because if the road is in near free flow conditions, adding one more vehicle to it doesn't slow anybody else down. And so the marginal congestion uh, externality cost is zero or maybe really close to zero. But if I choose to drive on a road close to when it is, um, you know, when it's ne nearing capacity, then I could be making a big impact on, on um, flow for the rest of the drivers. So we are currently looking into how those kinds of models are developed and trying to figure out if we can get a reasonable estimate for the actual marginal cost of driving on different roads at different times so that we can charge them. Usually congestion charging policies are much simpler than that. It's like, if you drive in this zone within these hours, you get charged. Um, or if you drive on this road, like a toll road, that there's a change in the toll during certain hours. Um, and so I think that might get to like in the last part of the project when we're talking about assessing different policies using the simulator, some of the things that we can do there is like actually charging someone real time for the marginal cost of traveling on a given road at a given moment. That actually might be not a crazy thing to do when you're in a world of Uber and Lyft where everybody's using apps to, uh, to give them directions and they're following the, you know, the routes and the apps. 
And so the app could take care of all that stuff without the driver having to do any calculations. So that could be plausible, especially as we move to autonomous vehicles, it really could be plausible that they could be uh, responding to that kind of um, more detailed congestion costs. Yeah, there's another question about um, the potential of switching to uh, charging for vehicle miles travel instead of charging for gas. So right now, so the, the main ways, or some of the main ways you can um, try to um, internalize these externalities, get the user who's creating the costs to pay for those costs is uh, through taxing gasoline. Um, but if you're talking about electric vehicles, that doesn't work anymore because electric vehicles are still causing other externalities on the road and they're not consuming gasoline. Um, so there's could be a switch toward charging per mile driven. And there's a bunch of reasons why you need to charge per gallon or per mile driven. Partly it's just to pay for the road. And that's the main justification in current policy in the US is uh, you know you drive more vehicles over the road, you bust up the road more and you have to maintain it. And so that goes to pay those things. Um, but these other types of costs that, that travel causes ideally would be embedded in the price. And so changing from gas tax to VMT pricing, um, I guess the, I guess some of the externalities like congestion are just about vehicles traveling. It doesn't matter how efficient the vehicle is. Uh, whereas some of them are about how much fuel you consume, how many emissions you produce. So ideally there would be some kind of mix of some costs per mile traveled to reflect the costs you cause to others when you travel, and then some costs per unit of emissions to reflect the cost to others as you create emissions. And so, you know, getting from the ideal to what you can do in practice depends on a whole bunch of things like what are, what's in the agency's purview and, uh, <laughs> you know, what do they actually have authority to do and those kinds of things. So yeah, in terms of the question of how it would affect TNCs, uh, I guess I'm not sure yet, but I think that in our, the study the work that we're working on now, we're looking at um, basically taxing both of those, taxing vehicle miles traveled when that's the externality and taxing emissions when that's the externality. And there's a question, I'm wondering about the equity implications of changes in car ownership. Would new drivers own a car otherwise in case they replace older cars, are emissions in their neighborhoods lower because cars are less polluting? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually it gets, when we get down into uh, the distributional impact of emissions, uh, it turns out Carnegie Mellon is part of a, um, or is leading a large uh, $10 million EPA center to study the impact of air emissions. And one of the areas of that impact is the um, environmental justice uh, component. So it's what are the distributional impacts of, uh, of uh, those emissions? So for example, if you change from a gasoline vehicle to an electric vehicle, instead of having the tailpipe emissions right there in the city, you move them to the smokestack of the power plant that's further away and also higher up. So the emissions spread out and, and go downwind in a much more distributed area. And it ends up having some interesting um, impacts for like, uh, it reduces impact to black Americans, for example, but it, it, it reduces the disparity in, in um, uh, air emission damages between black and white Americans, for example. So there's some really um, interesting um, effects there. So let's see, did I, so, oh, I'm sorry. So going back to the thing about the impacts in a particular neighborhood, that gets more difficult because even though you emit tailpipe emissions right in my neighborhood, it still may affect the next city over because they still do blow and interact with other things in the atmosphere and um, create particles downwind that might not just be in my city. So there's this whole distribution of those impacts. Um, so it makes it difficult when you're talking about that really high resolution to know uh, the distribution becomes harder to identify, I guess. And there's a, a couple more questions, but it looks like we're just about out of time. So um, I'd be delighted to get uh, any emails though, if people want to follow up and uh, have any more discussion. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing your work. And to all of today's attendees, thank you for joining us. This afternoon, you will be receiving an email asking you to take a short survey about today's SMC. Please take a few minutes to provide your feedback. Our next SMC will feature Justin Starr of Community College on Allegheny County and will be held on Friday, April 9th. Watch for your invitation to join us closer to that date. Again, thanks for attending today and please feel free to contact us with any questions.